corpus abdominis, it's superficial, right? I mean, it is right there on the front of the abdominal area. And then we got to go down a couple layers. We're going down into this deep layer of your abdominals called your transverse abdominis. And we got some awesome pictures to kind of give you an idea about how far around um, that torso that it actually goes. So um, we're going to start over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start over here at thoracolumbar fascia, just kind of give you an idea. I'm going to start from the back. So at the posterior aspect, um, in the back area, thoracolumbar, that's right, we're going all the way back there. You're like, Jill, that's not towards the front. I know it's not, because it goes all the way to the back. So it's going to go thoracolumbar fascia. Then it is going to um, have... Jill, yeah. Could, could I just, sorry to interrupt, yeah. interrupt yeah, yeah. you there. Um, if, if you guys notice this image here, yeah. obviously these are your lats right here, which also insert into your thoracolumbar fascia. Now there's actually three layers of thoracolumbar fascia. So you'd have to remove the lats and then you'd have to remove the, the second layer of thoracolumbar fascia. And then the transverse of abdominis is coming off the deepest layer of thoracolumbar fascia, which is underneath the lats and relatively also underneath the erector spinae as well. So you have to peel off the lats, peel off the erector spinae. Then that third layer of thoracolumbar fascia is where your transverse of abdominis is attaching into. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Because sometimes too, people think, oh, it's that superficial, even still deep, still deep back there. Um, so thoracolumbar fascia, and then it is going to um, have uh, uh, origin at the inside or internal surface of the lower six ribs, which interesting diaphragm last week also had um, some uh, origins at those inside uh, surfaces of the lower six ribs. Mm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> um, and then as it is going to um, come around towards the front, it is going to have an origin at the lateral inguinal ligament. Inguinal means groin. So it's a ligament that it's going to go from your pubic bone or your, your pubic tuberosity um, out towards your ASIS, that anterior superior iliac spine. So it's just a ligament that kind of crosses um, between those two bony points and muscles such as transverse abdominis will actually use it as an attachment site. And then also, whoo, the iliac crest. So it's it's got ribs inside of the ribs that it's, it's originating from. It's got the posterior iliac crest um, from the sides. It's got the, the thoracolumbar aponeuroses. It's got part of that inguinal ligament. So it's creating like a big girdle all, over, all the way around from front to back. It's the only muscle in our body that has a, like a totally complete, um, absolute like transverse uh, fiber alignment, all right? Just like, like stripes that are going across. Um, its insertion is it fascially blends, oh, sorry, part of the, sorry, there you go. insertion is it is going to um, uh, go all the way to the abdominal fascia and the linea alba. So if you were wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute. So it stops at that inguinal ligament? Nope, then the insertion is where it's gonna come around all the way to the front and then finish up at that abdominal fascia and linea alba. Um, if you could go back one second, I got so excited about those bony um, origins. The other thing with the origin too, and that's where we pointed out that um, it has that origin on the inside surface of those lower six ribs, similar to diaphragm. Um, if you look here, fascially, it blends with the diaphragm, it blends with the psoas, which we've talked about in previous webinars, and it is going to fascially blend with the QL, which is another deep, deep muscle of the back um, between the iliac crest and the last rib that we'll talk about today. So there it is in all its glory, in all its glory, everybody. Um, and, and this structure right here, here's your linea alba. So that's your belly button right there. The linea alba is this, from the xiphoid process all the way down to pubic symphysis. And it's also fascially blending into that mm. pubic symphysis, that piece of cartilage right between the two halves of your pelvis right there. Yep. So it's action. I love this picture right here. So um, Dr. Rosso will kind of show you where that uh, transverse abdominus is, where it goes all the way from the front to the back. So um, you, yeah. You look, yeah. Oops, sorry again, Joe. No, no, go just, ahead. Um, I'll point this out and then you can talk about the action. Mm -hmm. Here's your rectus abdominus right here in the front. So that's the two halves of your rectus abdominus. 
Then you have the innermost layer is your transverse abdominis, and you can kind of see it coming back here towards the spine, fascially blending in to that thoracolumbar fascia, this gray area right here. You see all the muscles that fascially blend into that area. Remember, as Jill mentioned, it also fascially blends with the psoas, the QL, and even the deep erector, all actually the superficial erectors and the lats, all fascially blend into that thoracolumbar fascia. So again, we have the deep layer, transverse abdominis, the intermediate layer, sort of intermediate layer is the internal obliques and the most superficial layer out to the side is the external obliques. We'll discuss the internal external obliques next week on part three of the two anatomy geeks series series. Cool. So what does transverse abdominis do? Um, you know, it just, it, it's, it's kind of like this muscle that's creating almost like this girdle type of thing around the abdominal area. Well, um, it, does a, it has a job of supporting. Um, it supports the abdominal organs. If you think about with your thoracic cavity, um, the rib cage that encircles your lungs and your, your heart, and they've got that to protect them. But what do your abdominal contents have? They don't have bone. No, they get muscle. Um, so that's why you've got not just this transverse abdominus, but you're going to have some like rectus abdominus and we'll talk about the obliques that are really going to help to kind of, it's like when you, you're wrapping a package, right? To, to send it somewhere and you want to make sure that you wrap it really securely. So you wrap it in all different directions. It's kind of what your body's doing to those abdominal contents is wrapping them up and transverse abdominus is that tape that you put around the outside of that box. Um, it stabilizes the rib cage because it has attachments at the ribs. It stabilizes the spine. It stabilizes the pelvis. Remember, it's got that attachment to the um, iliac crest. It has an attachment to the um, inguinal ligament. And then it aids in respiration, breathing. And um, when you're coughing, when you're sneezing, blowing up a balloon, trying to blow through a straw, whatever you, you need to kind of increase that force of exhalation, your transverse abdominus will work by um, squeezing and kind of squeezing those abdominal contents, which then push them up against that diaphragm we talked about last week, which then pushes up into that thoracic cavity, which helps to empty out your lungs even more than just a regular quiet breath. Transverse abdominus is, God, that's it here. You know what? If you may, I got I to gotta, I gotta change for a second. Hang on. Hang on. Uh oh, what do we got here? Oh no! Wait for it, just one second. I told you guys this. This, this is why. This is why we teamed up. This is why we created the series. (laughs) Just okay. Here, hang on, hang on. Oh no! What do you got there? What do you got? All right, let me put this back. Transverse abdominus is like this shirt. Now it's not all the way up here, but here's what I think about George. Take second, take a little break there. Second fiddle for a second. I want to be changed. So when I think about rectus abdo- or how rectus abdominis is going to be relative to my um, transverse abdominis, I like to put on a striped shirt because the striped shirt is going to represent the fiber direction of that deep transverse abdominis as it goes from the front at that, um, that linea alba and that um, abdominal uh, aponeuroses and then travels all the way back, goes along that iliac crest all the way back towards that deep um, thoracolumbar fascia. And then don't forget, it's gonna be tucked up underneath my ribs um, you know, on that inside surface of those lower, uh, those ribs six through 12. So I like to get a little visual in there with that. So that's the transverse abdomen. That's awesome. So I used to tell Melissa, she, you should, you should have distended lower abdomen. I'd say, Oh, it's your weak lower abs. We have to do lower ab training. And we did t- tons of transverse, transverse abdominus activation. It never changed her, her lower abs until I actually taught her how to breathe well and align and breathe well. Now, this is Melissa doing crunches. What do you, what do you see with her lower abdomen? Watch where my arrow is. What do you see? You see what? Is her abdomen coming in or going out? It's bulging out. So what I want you to ask mm-hmm. you, this is how most people are crunching. Will that create a, a smaller waistline or does it actually create a more distended waistline? Because how can you crunch and push your, your abdomen out and somehow think that this is going to create a smaller abdomen. So this is what you need to educate your clients on. Crunching does not make a smaller abdomen. 
What makes a smaller abdomen is your diet and using your abdominal wall properly. It's not because you did thousands of crunches. It's because if you go back here and look at this bodybuilder, what makes it look like he's a small abdomen? He's pulling his abs in. He's squeezing, he's, he's bearing down and he's pulling his abs in. So that's what, what all these fitness models are doing. And they're super lean. So that's what creates that, that lean abdomen look. It's not because they did thousands of crunches. Thousands of crunches just built the muscles up so, so you can see the abdominal wall better. But it's a diet and the use of the abdominal wall in a relatively optimal manner that makes the waist small. So you have to educate your clients because they want to feel their abdominal wall working and they feel it working with crunches and leg lifts and sit-ups. But they're also going to feel their low back. They're also going to feel distension at some point. They're also going to feel urinary incontinence because they're putting so much pressure down into their lower abdomen. One of the things we do after three-dimensional breathing is some version of the modified dead bug. So this is actually a very challenging pattern. I probably wouldn't do this as your first exercise. I would do what we did last time, the happy baby position with the leg lift. So if you haven't watched that one, most of you were on last time, refer back to last time. This would be a next pattern. The prerequisite is three-dimensional breathing. If your client cannot do three-dimensional breathing well, if they do not align the thoracopelvic cylinder well, don't have them do this pattern. They must be able to maintain thoracopelvic cylinder alignment and breathing. There should be no shaking, breath holding, or face turning red. Those are all signs of a suboptimal strategy. So I'm taking Melissa through this. We've done this lots and lots of times. But again, it took Melissa a long time to learn this. And because she, she had to unlearn a lot of her, of her old strategies as well. So we'll have her put her arms up on the wall behind her head, about shoulder width apart. She gently engages the wall with her arms. And, that, and you can see right here, before she lifts her legs, good alignment of her thoracopelvic cylinder. She's still doing three-dimensional breathing. I've already taught her that. She already knows how to do that. This has to be the prerequisite. You cannot see any arching in the low back. You cannot see the ribcage flare up. If they can't get this position, they can't do the next step. So they can just hold this position and breathe. This is a, the first step of the exercise. They'll go home and use this for a week or two weeks or three weeks, however long it takes before we ever lift the legs. Now we can lift the legs up. If they maintain this position, you can lift one leg up now. So again, lift one leg up, you still see that alignment. It does not change. Now this is where, where you really have to watch your client is when they lift that second leg off the floor or off the table. Do you see there's no change? Let me go back just a little bit. There's absolutely no change in Melissa's rib cage, spine or pelvis as that second leg comes up off the wall. That's how you know they've owned that position. And now they do three-dimensional three breathing in this position. So they own, they marry this, the breathing and the alignment. And again, then they can go, third step is leg, leg motion. But again, for most of our clients, it's just lift your legs up and breathe because that's challenging enough. Again, if you see any shaking, breath holding, or face turning red, if you see any extension, put your hand underneath this portion, that thoracolumbar junction. If you can get your hand underneath there, they're not maintaining that cylinder alignment. They're not flattening their back down, but they're not also, we're not allowing them to arch that back, that rib cage up off the floor or the table in this case. And then the third step, as I mentioned, is bring your legs out. But again, there should be no change of that thoracopelvic cylinder alignment. We've worked a long time on this pattern with Melissa, which is why she's making it look so relatively easy. It's not easy for your clients, especially your older clients, with that diastasis recti, with that flared rib cage, with that non-optimal belly breathing strategy.